just because the you know it, it does have a little bit of a factor so um, do you have an idea of how the uh, the LSAT fits in uh, you know there's another question about should you wait till you get to a higher LSAT or go to early decision how how do you balance sure. that, that, that path? Yeah, so I took the LSAT twice uh, and got nearly exactly the same score uh, both times. So it, it must be a, a decent evaluation, uh, but at the same time, I've had many friends who have gotten uh, higher the next time they've gone around to. It all depends how much you put into it. And for me, uh, having gone through a master's and, and having a full-time job, I didn't have a lot of time to dedicate to studying for the exam. Uh, so uh, if, if you have the time, I would say definitely what you put in is what you're going to get out of it. Um, and there is always opportunities to um, apply uh, and then get a new grade that's put in. A lot of universities allow you to allow an extra statement, which might say, uh, which you might be able to say, hey, I'm taking the LSAT again. Uh, so keep that in consideration as you consider my application. I would always say apply early as best as you can and, and often to as many universities as you think you possibly can and, and afford. I know the application fees are not always cheap. Um, you can always get waivers on those too if you have any uh, socioeconomic issues with that. You can check out LSAC. They have kind of uh, scholarships or otherwise to pay for a lot of those applications as well. So keep that in mind. Um, but as far as uh, applications, I would say get in at the early bird registration if you can or shortly thereafter. And you can always update your LSAT score and LSAC will do that for you in your LSAC file. So I would recommend that. And the major reason why I would say that is important is because you want to consider the window for financial aid and for any scholarships or other opportunities. So the academic year works that sometime in January or February, a lot of those decisions are made. So if you make uh, an application in January or sometime thereafter, they have already may have already considered candidates for financial aid before that. And so you don't want to miss out on a lot of scholarship opportunities that would become available because of that. So uh, don't be afraid about your, your first score that you get. Um, you can, there's always an opportunity to be, to do better. And, you know, ultimately it's going to work out the way it's going to work out for you. So. Thank you. Yeah. What, what is the, the timeline? I think I got mine in about Christmas, but I felt like I was a little late. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what it is for Wisconsin. I know that like some of the early birds are like September to October. I want to say like the general uh, registration, most cutoffs I think are early January or late December. Um, so yeah, but uh, don't be afraid to shoot for the stars. I mean, I, I shot for the stars on the universities that, well, clearly I didn't get into, but I thought maybe I would. And, and who knows, you know, it puts out, put your name out there. Uh, and I think some of the, some of the, you know, seeing that I had applied to places like Harvard and didn't get in, it still gave an opportunity that like I am fighting for this. Um, and I, I definitely didn't have uh, the means or the socioeconomic means definitely coming from semi rural Wisconsin to, to afford that. Uh, but just being able to, again, that, that is a way of creating a network and, and you wouldn't be surprised. Don't be afraid, again, to shoot for the stars. Yeah, and I'd also say too, uh, there are a couple people in my class at Hamlin uh, who ended up transferring to back to Madison after their uh, 1L year. So uh, right. you know, if you don't get in where you want to go or you know, get lined up where you want to go, there's always that option as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And you want to do that in your first year. There's, uh, there's a number of universities that, that, that will do that. And it, especially if it's something where you see you come to a school like wherever um, and it, it doesn't have exactly what you want, but you're getting that first year of law done, which is in, in every law school is, is pretty much the same, that same kind of eight or nine classes. You can always, you can always move up. Um, and so work really hard. Your first year is going to be really important to uh, not only uh, your academic ability and the opportunity to move to another law school, but also for your job prospects as well. So, Yeah, uh, to kind of wrap up the admission side of things, um, how about um, other, I guess, requirements? We talked, to, you mentioned a little bit about the personal statement. Um, mm -hmm. How does that, how do you, how do, you do that uh, to stand out? Um, do you want to focus yeah. on any work experience that's particularly related to law or maybe your academics? I guess, how, how do you get them to see you? It really depends on your situation. Um, I think my best advice on a personal statement is dig deep, okay? Uh, I used, I mean, I, 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 it was a moment of reflection for me in my life and, and thinking about, is law school really what I want to do and why is that? Um, so I identify as a queer man. A part of my personal statement happened to do with that um, and experiences that I've faced and discrimination I've faced uh, as a queer man. 
Now that isn't necessarily to say that you need to use your identity uh, to, to uh, get into a law school, but if there is an impactful story that showed uh, your uh, redemption, your resilience, whatever that might be, um, I would highly encourage to dig deep. It is something that is going to be emotional um, as you write that, but processing that emotion as well it can give you the opportunity to use that to your better when you are in law school. Um, and it's something that uh, I have done to go on to advocate for the LGBT community through our few law organization. Uh, and it's something that has continued to propel me to do uh, what, what I do in law, which is for uh, standing up for smallholder farmers and, 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 and businesses and, and, and the indigenous community um, for uh, food related issues. So. Are there letters of recommendation that are part of the, I'm trying to think, uh, is that still part of the application? Generally, yes. Uh, it, again, it's going to depend by school. Uh, I think Wisconsin might have two, as I recall. Um, but uh, there's definitely opportunity to, to add more. Uh, yeah, definitely reach out, try and get, I think most cases they ask for an academic reference and then some other form of reference. If you have a work reference or otherwise, uh, be thinking about that and, and who might best serve uh, to do that. Um, so yeah, yeah, the general data is included. So one of the interesting questions that came in was related to um, dual degrees. And it sounded like you, did you finish your master's first or uh, talk a little bit about how you paired those together? Yeah, so uh, I actually did a master's abroad in food culture and communication. Oh, right. And now I'm doing a master's in international public affairs uh, in addition to my JD. So that's a dual program, which is uh, formally set up by a law school. Um, and as I went through my law school experience, I, I, I realized that there's kind of two worlds in law and policy. Law focuses on what we have today and what we have in our history and trying to interpret what that means for us, i.e. our constitution and otherwise. And policy is a little more forward thinking. Um, and I wanted to have experience in both of those. I wanted to be able to place myself in an opportunity where I could make impact, not only in the legal world, but also in the policy world. Um, and so that's what led me to the uh, Master of International Public Affairs program. As I mentioned, the kind of issue that I'm looking at is an international food systems-based scope. Um, and I think the other reason for that was to get some quantitative skills. So it's the running joke that lawyers aren't good at math, um, and that's quite true. Um, and so I, with, with some exception, you know, maybe some of the, the engineering folk who end up being, uh, you know, IP lawyers or things like that might have a little more uh, math skill or my, my friend who's a, a PhD in chemistry and is coming back to get a law degree might know a little bit more about math uh, than I do. Uh, but I knew if I wanted to do research in policy, if I wanted to make impact on uh, global food and agricultural issues, I needed to have some sort of uh, math background and economic background to do that. And that's why I chose the Master of International Public Affairs program. But I would say uh, Mo and the team at, at the La Paulette School make it very easy. Uh, and you can blend a lot of classes together. You can take electives that are law-based or policy-based, um, and, and it gives you an opportunity to really kind of have a lot more flexibility in your, your curriculum rather than just having kind of one narrow stream. Um, I missed one admissions question. Uh, I think maybe per partly related to Madison. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you need a foreign language to be considered for law school? Are there, uh, and are the chances of being accepted to Madison's law school greater if you're from a UW school? So I guess two uh, sure. There. Yeah. So two parts there. Yeah. So the uh, foreign language requirement, uh, the law school does not, uh, to my knowledge, require a foreign language. So I'm sure it does make uh, it a bit more competitive. I will say for those of you who have taken some foreign language or are considering taking it in uh, undergrad, highly encourage it because there are very great scholarships available. Uh, the national uh, FLAS program, uh, of which the University of Wisconsin is a part of, allows for an entire year of tuition remission plus something around a 20 or 25k uh, stipend uh, in addition to that that helps with housing and living and all sorts of things if you continue your uh, uh, foreign language studies now to make that to, to kind of uh, have a caveat to that the best way to do that and to get competitive for that uh, scholarship or fellowship is to do a language which is considered critical to the nation. Um, so uh, some more, some, some languages which are necessary primarily for governmental purposes. Uh, I have studied Swahili before, which is the language of 
uh, kind of Eastern Africa um, and uh, I've traveled to Kenya, so that's why I kind of picked up on it. That's, I know one of the languages, Arabic is a very hot language and, and necessary for that as well. So look into that program, uh, program it's called FLAS, F-L-A-S, for any of those who um, uh, do have foreign language experience or are looking to continue their foreign language experience because it's a great opportunity. And like I said, tuition remission for the full uh, year plus uh, a stipend on top of that, which is uh, you know, very, very nice. And ultimately, if you consider the 20K, that, that pays for two thirds of your law school um, at that point, if you look at it that way. And then the other question, uh, I'm sorry, was about, um, oh, if you went to a UW school, if that makes it more competitive. Uh, so I will say, I, I, I don't, I, I think that is partially part of the admissions decision. Uh, I will say that I think our, at least our class of 200, more or less, uh, 185, I think we are, uh, is about 60, 40 out of state. I could be in, incorrect there, but generally it sits somewhere around 50-50. Um, so I think you have about just as, as good of odds, but I think if, yeah, if you've made impact at your school, again, that holistic look at your application is what's going to be uh, most important. Um, and, uh, you know, key, if you have any sort of uh, public policy or interest in giving back to the state of Wisconsin, I'm sure that would be a very valuable asset to the University of Wisconsin Law School as well in their application process. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to ask a uh, well, slightly different more challenging question, and that is, if you could have done anything different in your journey so far, uh, what would you have done differently? Oh, nothing. No, um, I think, uh, you know, maybe joining law school earlier uh, would have been the only thing, but I think the way my unique path took, I don't think it would have been uh, mature enough or in the right mindset to take on law school. Um, I think it's very important to have some form of unique experience, and perhaps you've had that already in your life, that will give you the, the will when you are, you know, super deep in, you know, 300 pages of constitutional law reading for that particular week, it's going to be something that's going to flip the switch and tell you to keep reading. Um, no joke, we do read a lot every week, and we do a lot of writing, uh, and you've got to be okay with that. And, and to be okay with that, you have to have something, a little fire within you that, that burns you. Uh, so, you know, uh, for, for Jamie, clearly that's, that's immigration-related issues. Um, and, and Devin, if you're interested in, uh, you know, uh, IP or something related to engineering, I, we have a lot, of, a lot of individuals here who, who come out of an engineering background as well and have excelled at law school because they're focusing uh, very much on that. And, 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 and you find your niche and, and you just keep burning. And especially through that first year of law school, I'm sure as Ray can say, it's definitely the toughest. Um, and it's one that you, uh, you know, you're, you're getting out of your element and you're being inundated with so much information that is so foreign to you. Um, and, you know, sometimes you really just want to break down and cry. And, and the reality is, if you just get through that first year, you're going to you're going to find on the other side of that uh, that rainbow, there's, there's a great pot of gold. And that is the opportunity to define yourself in law, uh, I think. So. Yeah, very good. You know, one of the uh, kind of I think I think it was an encouraged reading before starting was uh, Scott Turow's 1L. Um, sure. And I, I think it says in there. Uh, and this became true, is that at some point in your first year, you will cry <laughs> at some point. Um, right. But uh, but yeah, it is it is worth it. Um, yeah, you know, so, you, yeah so, uh, sorry, other, other general, you know, what I'll just find your tribe, find your people who you can, who will be there for you thick and thin, um, and, you know, develop great study groups, uh, great habits, get great outlines, work, you know, especially for your first year, just work through the entire outline yourself. Uh, and just absorb it as much as possible. And I, I look back on that one all year and I'm like, I am so glad I'm through it, but I'm so happy I did it as well. Cause it's an incredible mental, mental as well as physical uh, challenge that, that defines, are, are you a lawyer? Um, and I think all of you uh, have, have the capacity to do that just fine. Yeah, so you've talked about study groups just now and, and um, outlines. So what resources, uh, have been available to you either through your school or, or just you know yeah. knowing good people um, that have helped you be successful or help navigate law school. Yeah, I'll say. I mean, I think that's that's a, a great difficulty with law school uh, is finding resources. Part of being a good lawyer is finding the resources that are necessary. 
And we're lucky that the University of Wisconsin is a very collaborative university, uh, but I've heard from a number of my other uh, friends and colleagues who've gone to other law schools, and it is, I, I would recommend a movie, The Paper Chase, um, for anyone uh, that is interested in, in the competitive nature that is law school. Again, I would say uh, Wisconsin Law School is a very collaborative law school, but uh, there are a number of law schools out there still which are very cutthroat, uh, so much so that they hide resources that are generally available. Of course, this is much harder nowadays with online resources like Westlaw and Lexis, um, but uh, it's definitely a thing. And try not to give into that toxic uh, environment and try to, uh, you know, ultimately work across the line. You're going to have to do it when you become a lawyer uh, as you get out in the field. You're going to have to work across across the aisle in the courtroom or you know in the negotiation table or wherever you happen to be working as a lawyer. Um, and so getting resources, uh, I would say at the University of Wisconsin Law School, uh, they've done a great job of creating what they call the Academic Enhancement Program. It's available for everyone and they do a great job through uh, from the introduction and otherwise. Uh, it's uh, run by Dean Moji, uh, wonderful lady. She uh, They provide resources for um, uh, what are those books called? Like the Emanuel books, they're like outlines and things uh, that are done for classes in general, maybe not for your specific professor, but those resources are invaluable. They give you so much information. There's a number of classes. If you're really struggling, uh, there's a great opportunity for uh, discussion groups that are available through AEP as well. Every law school likely has something like this. Um, they have, an, uh, it, it's a great academic resource. As far as uh, kind of, uh, if we wanna bring in uh, like the mental health and personal side as well too, I think every uh, law student needs to check in with their mental health at some point and needs to ensure that they are proactively developing a team of people and a team of, uh, you know, and an opportunity to uh, think proactively about their mental health. We stress this a lot at the University of Wisconsin Law School and at every law school. Physical fitness is a great opportunity to make sure that you uh, are checking in with your mental health. Uh, we have a lot of great um, meditation seminars and others that are led by uh, fellow uh, law students or others out in the community that are available for free. They bring in puppies during final season. Um, those are all great resources. But I'll also say in terms of checking in on mental health, uh, finding a niche group for you. For me, uh, as a queer person, LGBTQ organization of QLaw was very important for me in keeping my stability throughout law school. And I think that was the case for many others. You have shared experiences with a certain group of people, every one of you do, and finding that group in the law school, whether it's a formal student organization or not, I would highly encourage you to do that because it's going to allow you, and do it proactively, it's going to allow you to lean on people. And it's also gonna allow you to find a lot of networking opportunities out in the field. For me, that means I've engaged with a lot of uh, LGBTQ lawyers across the nation. I've had the opportunity to go to uh, student uh, uh, bar uh, conferences that are, it, it, well, it would have been in DC this year, but uh, last year it was in Philly uh, for the LGBT bar. And you get to meet with people and, and talk about common experiences that you have outside of just your work. And that allows you to be able to build a rapport with that person so that you could work professionally as well. So I highly encourage that. That's all really great advice. Awesome. Uh, and, you know, personally for, for my 1L group, we, uh, we formed a racquetball league. Um, and so yeah. we each played with a different person each week and it was, you know, it was a great way to get out of the library for a few minutes. Um, right. And definitely a great gateway to, to meeting new people. Um, exactly. you know, so Tony, let us know we got a little less than 15 minutes to go. So um, how about we open it up? Um, yeah. What, what, uh, all right, thanks, Devin. And uh, you know, you know, just kind of open it up. What questions might you have? What What are you interested in? Um, yeah, feel free to just unmute yourself, and and you know, we're a small enough group to have a conversation. Uh, but this has been really great advice. Uh, I know we did a, a lot of networking in in law school, and a lot of chances to meet people. It just kind of helps you narrow things down. And um, so, I guess, what what are some of you thinking? Um, there was one thing I wanted to talk about, which you've touched on before. So I'm really interested in going to Madison Law School as well. And the early decision deadline is November 15th. And so I'm not taking my LSAT again until October 3rd. And I know it takes about roughly a month to get your scores in and all that. And I've also read that the CAS, like those whole package report things that you have to purchase, 
through LSAC to be sent to the law school. It says that takes about two to three weeks to process as well. And that's like with your letters of recommendation, uh, your transcripts, all of that. So are you saying that I could put that all together since I do have a LSAT score right now? I can put all that together, send that out to Madison by that November deadline, and then still have that updated score just sent to them once that comes in? Correct. Yep, that's correct. So you could apply today. If you have your letter of recommendations in order, you could apply today. Um, and then uh, you can either write a letter in there or they will automatically see your score when it updates in the LSEC file too. So if they haven't decided on their pool of candidates, they're going to go back and see who's left in LSAC and they're going to see, okay, this person's here and oh wow, they've advanced in their uh, LSAC grade. Maybe that's an opportunity where we're gonna look at them again. So it is kind of a, in, in a way a rolling basis. Um, so you will always still kind of stay in that pool. So um, keep that in mind, but if you can flag them beforehand, and again, if you get the opportunity to talk with their missions crew or otherwise, the more you speak with them and you network with them as well too and build a rapport there, they might, you know, be able to flag your file as well. So again, it's a very people oriented profession and, and always try and, uh, you know, you know put, put yourself out there. Don't be afraid to. Okay. Uh, Matt, have you had to pivot at all in any of your education? Uh, generally? Um, wow, great question. Um, I know, well, I mean, we could speak to COVID now, but uh, I, I think so. I mean, I think I, I'm, an, I, I'm an interesting case for law school. I came from a hospitality background, uh, which, by the way, I think gave an incredible and actually a lot of skills transfer from that. If you're willing to work and serve others, I think that naturally transfers to, uh, to a, a law program as well. I think a lot of people don't see that. They don't see the bridge between that. And so it's been a little bit of an uphill battle, I'll be honest, trying to defend that. Um, but ultimately, I know where I want to be and what, um, why those experiences in my life created who I am um, and provided me a unique opportunity and asset. So when we talked about that personal statement of, uh, you know, defining ourselves, I did have to pivot. I did have to make that, that distinction and, and difference and say, hey, this is why I'm interested. And I had a lot of fear about whether or not... Uh, a law school would accept me based on that. Um, and so I knew I had to get as best a score I could on the LSAT. Uh, and I knew that I had to, you know, cause that is still a very important piece. Um, and so I know actually, I should say also a lot of uh, schools outside of Wisconsin, I shouldn't say a lot, there's a, a, a minority that are also including the GRE as an opportunity instead of an LSAT. Um, so keep that in mind as you look at other schools as well, or if you do. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely had to pivot. And with COVID uh, this summer, I was actually supposed to be uh, in Ghana and then Berlin working on uh, human rights-based work. Um, but unfortunately that didn't work out uh, because of COVID. And so uh, I'm working now with the uh, Law and Entrepreneurship Clinic. I'm also working with the uh, indigenous tribe out, out uh, in, in Northern uh, Wisconsin, focusing on their writing their food code for them to, to keep sovereignty uh, away from the federal government. So. I did also, I just wanted to know, I know I said it in the chat, but I did leave my, uh, my LinkedIn there and my email. So uh, if you guys ever have any questions uh, as you're kind of going through the application process or you're stressed out about what I should write in my personal statement or anything, really, I'm, I'm very open uh, to, to uh, helping you through that process. I know just having an advocate there is very important and ultimately that's what we as lawyers are. Um, and passing it forward is very important. So always feel free to reach out to me. Um, and if you don't feel free reaching out to me, I can also, uh, you know, find someone who might best be a mentor for you that is in the law school currently. Um, so I think, uh, I, I'm sorry, it was uh, Jamie, I think, I mean, like we have a, I would love to introduce you to Aaron who runs our immigration law clinic. Um, there are opportunities, even if you're anywhere near the area, uh, to kind of volunteer with the clinic even before law school. And that's great uh, experience and opportunity. Even if you come for once or twice, it builds that relationship and that opportunity. Uh, and we'd be happy to do that for you. So if you have uh, other interests or things, if you let me know that by an email, I'll, I'll do my best to try and find people in the law school that can really help you and give you a, a clear idea of what it's like here at, at Wisconsin Law School. Cool. Um, yeah, I was actually going to ask about that if I could. Um, I've been really interested in possibly like volunteering somewhere and just getting that like experience like hands on before I do go into law school. So I was wondering yeah. if you have any advice on how to approach 
maybe like an internship or like a job or a shadow or anything like that? You're in Oshkosh, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah um, I'm not as familiar with Oshkosh. I'm from Green Bay originally, but if you can find even just any experience with a non-governmental organization, a, a nonprofit or something that focuses on immigration, that's going to look great on your resume. Um, if you can, I mean, don't, don't be afraid to go like ask an immigration lawyer that's at, um, in Oshkosh, knock on their door and say, hey, I would be happy to just follow you and shadow you for a day and see what opportunities there are. That's someone who, A, it might get open up to a job opportunity or even an internship opportunity or something uh, where, you know, they're shadowing you. But that can also be a letter of recommendation for you because they're going to see that you're very interested in that opportunity and be able to get into law school. So use those unique opportunities, whatever it is. I, I just know that, Jamie, you're interested in immigration, but if there are others who are interested, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, political science, whatever it is, I mean, Try and knock, knock through those doors, if you're, especially if you're political science now. I mean, work with a campaign. Find someone uh, this year who, is, uh, uh, who, who matches your qualities and, and can speak to who you are as an individual and continue to find that fire within you that's going to help you get through law school. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Like I say, uh, uh, feel free to uh, reach out by email. I'll get you in touch with Aaron. One other quick question. Um, you you uh, shared a great resource about uh, you know possible scholarships uh, and those sorts of opportunities. Um, is Madison doing scholarships? I guess what are some good ways to to pay for law school? As uh, we know, yeah, uh, it's expensive. Scholarships are going to be your primary way, and that's why I said you know get your application early um, because it's a pretty streamlined process with the law school. Um, you'll be able to kind of uh, I think I don't know what they they have a system for, it, but I think. Uh, you know, you can very clearly see the ones that, uh, I mean, you put a profile in, they're going to try and match you with as many scholarships as they possibly can. And when that doesn't happen, there's like a whole nother slew of scholarships that's available in this system. Um, and you can look through them and see, you know, for instance, if, uh, if for the LGBTQ organization, we just raised money for a scholarship. So one of our uh, newly entering 1Ls will get at least a $1,000 scholarship. Last year it was a $3,000 one. It all depends how much we raised. So and don't be afraid to look at outside sources as well. Um, there's going to be a number of, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the economic justice organization. Uh, it, it's not coming to me at the moment, but definitely just, you know, Google the heck out of it and, and see that there's going to be a lot of opportunities uh, and you'll be surprised, uh, especially if you can find anything uh, that relates to your identity. It's going to give you an opportunity for a scholarship. It's going to give you an opportunity to meet people who have been very impactful. I met a judge, Ron Elbers, who was from San Francisco, um, who ended up, you know, uh, uh, we ended, I ended up getting a scholarship uh, from, basically from him um, because of my work with the, the community as well. He was the first openly LGBTQ judge uh, elected by a Republican governor in the state of California. Um, so uh, he's become a, a mentor and an ally for me. He took me up with people from uh, the UNFAO and people that are very connected in the food world so even as every time, as you're looking for scholarships, no matter what it is, be looking for that network as well and, 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 and continue to keep that, uh, that line of contact there. I'll answer the question. Um, final thoughts, sort of, uh, if somebody would have told me this, I wish somebody had told me this, what would, what would that be? Uh, what's a, kind of a, your last pithy thought? Yeah, yeah, especially as a 3L now, right? If someone would, <laughs> would tell me uh, something as like a 1L, um, uh, I would say it's going to be okay. I mean, there's, there's so many opportunities in law school just off the cuff that, you know, you're going to think, is this for me? Is, I'm not even up to the day that I started law school. I thought, is this for me? Is this what I'm doing? My God, what am I getting myself into? Uh, especially having to pay for law school. It's a lot of burden. But that burden can also give you, I'm sure as many of you have learned in the COVID times as well too, when you're left with your thoughts and thinking about who I am and what I am and the challenge of what is my life going to bring, you have the opportunity to use that as a positive in your life. And, and that gives you, because you have that time, you have the time to think very carefully about it and think about what is it that is the next step for me. So it's, it's going to be okay. There are plenty of resources. You just got to you know, keep your mouth open and your ears open and find them and, and, uh, and, 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 and be, just be open to the ride that is, is law school and know that Grades don't matter at the end of the day, okay? You're going to get through it. Uh, there are requirements for that. But if you have the ability to speak, as any of you will as lawyers, you have the ability to walk yourself into a door, right? Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's on my cup here, didn't become the first, you know, uh, woman in her, her law program 
uh, and also, you know, uh, one of the first Supreme Court justices because uh, she sat behind. No, she did her husband's work in law school uh, when he was suffering uh, with, with ill health. And she fought her way into law school and she fought her way uh, onto the Supreme Court and she continues to fight for her place as well. Um, so I think uh, just keep going and, 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 and don't stop. And there, like I said, there's going to be moments, but just keep going.